I'm going to ask each of our panellists to tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, so I'm going to allow them to introduce yourselves, um, because you will do a far greater job than I will, waiting anyway. So um, let's start with Adrienne on the, the far side. Thank you, Julia. My name is Adrienne Saunders, and I am a world champion athlete. And when I retired from sports and started my business career, I noticed that in business, unlike in sports, the majority of the women in my teams had low confidence and they were quite shy about their successes. So ever since, I've been passionate about helping women boost their business confidence and as soon as possible in their careers. And this is why I'm heading up the Fearless Female Graduate Program at the Scares Farm. Hi there, um, I'm Jill Graflin. I currently lead um, at American Express our European customer servicing for our card business. Um, I started at American Express in the US um, in marketing and then moved over to customer service. And um, I currently lead our women's interest network uh, for Sussex at the company. Um, and it's, uh, I love the name of the conference, Fearless Female, because one of the things that I see in young women who are very talented is a lot of fear and they need a lot of encouragement to overcome those fears. So I'm really happy to be here today. Hello there, I'm Nikki Gattenby, MD and uh, owner of Propellanet. We're a digital marketing agency based in Brighton. Working with brands such as Waitrose, Evan Cycles, Dogs Trust, uh, Coroni Holidays, Forest Holidays, helping them to be found online. Um, we've been consistently ranked one of the best top places to work in the UK for the last six years running. And that's a lot to do with our culture and the way the business is balanced. We're 50-50 male-female. And there's a lot of things we do from onboarding, recruiting, progression and returning in terms of helping that balance stay as it is. Um, from a top level on the board, the balance isn't there. It's three to one, men to women. Um, and that needs to be addressed. But there's lots of things we are doing to help address that with getting more women into the workplace, helping more women get involved in STEM and tech and getting involved in local things like Maker Club. So I'd love to explore that more with you if you've got questions around that. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Zoe Wright. I'm Group Director of People at BNCE. Um, we're the provider of the People's Pension. Um, we've got about 500 staff and we're based in Crawley. Um, so a lot smaller than some of the big organisations, but we have, for the last couple of years, been really focused on the diversity and inclusion agenda um, specifically around women into leadership and we haven't managed to move the dial a bit so when I first started the work we were 22% female in our leadership positions and we're now 34% so in the last 18 months we have managed to move the dial. Great, thank you very much ladies and thank you for joining us. So we have a wealth of experience and expertise at the front um, so this is, this is a great opportunity um, for all of you to pose your questions to the panellists. Um, whatever questions you have around that broad topic of how to attract, retain uh, more females um, and also grow female leadership. So this one's over to you. We've got Jamie with a roving mic ready to um, receive your questions and the panel are eager to respond. So what questions do you have for the panel? Hi everyone, I'm Adele King from Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Holidays. Um, I just wondered what sort of initiatives you've seen working your respective organisations and previously to help females take that step from almost entry level into their first leadership type role um, and, and what has worked that you, you've observed because it's, it's something that we're really concentrating on and yes, we want, in, uh, we want people in senior leadership roles who are female, but it's that initial transition that's going to help for the future. I'm interested to hear that. I'll have to take that. Um, one of the things I'm really keen on is mentoring and picking out someone that you can help a mentor and buddying people up right from the start. When people join Propellanet, they get a buddy and we want to extend that programme so that the buddy is there for longer. But 
making sure that there is a direct relationship with someone they can aspire to be like or someone they can ask questions of and know that that person is there because sometimes it can feel like you don't have a support network or you're supposed to find all the answers yourself you know we're human we need to talk to each other so having that mentoring position is a really strong thing from the start also having a coaching environment within the business so it's not just line management where you you kind of have a very sort of um progressive relationship with your line manager and how, how can I go next in this line of my career but a more a wide set coaching mindset of how can I develop myself overall not just in the role I'm in at the moment but what I can do for the future to open up for women I could go be the CEO not just where can I go in this track I'm on at the moment so mentoring and coaching would be big things for me right from the start. Can I also comment? Yeah. Um, so we set up a gender balance network last year and we decided to focus on our team leaders and our specialist roles up to managers. And we've got now 90 female employees out of only 500 staff, so it's quite a big percentage on the programme. Initially, when we started, I kind of thought, oh, I wonder if there's any interest for this. Every <laughs> single woman put her hand up. You know, there was not any kind of apathy there. Everyone wants a piece of this. Um, and we started with using um, a tool called Insights. So it's a colour, you know, red, green, blue, um, yellow. So it's quite an easy thing to use. Um, and we did individual profiling for every single person. So they had a better understanding of themselves. Um, and then we started using that within um, networking sessions and also um, kind of sessions around things like personal brand, um, speaking with confidence, chairing a meeting, that kind of thing. Um, and just giving them um, access to each other and out of that they have started mentoring each other so the more senior people because we invited our already female leaders in the organization to kind of co-chair the groups um, they've already started creating networks to kind of mentor each other so it's working really well even leaving it a bit informal seems to work great so slightly, slightly different so, so Nikki if I may just just to pick up on so you've mentioned mentoring and coaching as well. Um, in my experience, it's not always easy to convince an organization to invest time and, and potentially budget into introducing formal coaching and mentoring um, procedures. How did, how did you go about that? How, how hmm. easy or difficult, how did you convince your decision makers in your organization that it, it was the right thing to do? Um, I'm really lucky. Our, our board are very open-minded to this kind of development with people. And what we did was we employed a resident coach in the business and people could self-select in the business to, to work with that coach. And what I was hoping was that the experience of working with a coach would be so positive they would tell other people in the business about it. And that's exactly what happened. And we've got about 80% of the team now signed up to work with a resident coach. So that's kind of from ground up and the people's actions informing the fact that coaching is really helping. What we're also doing on top of that is um, a number of us um, are going on a coaching training course. I don't doubt that after a week we'll be experts in coaching, but from a, a, the top level in the ops board and two of the team in the room here, um, we're going to learn how to be coaches ourselves and enable not only the bottom-up approach to happen, but top-down too. So everyone has that ability to enjoy being coached but also understand how to be a coach. And if we could be more of a coaching organisation, we could coach our clients as well, which would be a brilliant place to be. Great, thank you. Sometimes people need to experience it to, uh, to truly see the value. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you for that question. What other questions do you have? So I guess 
not really a question, but then to, to draw it into a question, I just wanted to make that as a statement that was heard. Yeah. And as a question, I just want to say, you know, do you, how is that played out in more organisations? And do you see it sometimes as a sort of a, a tick box and we have photos, but where's the real representation? Uh, it's a great observation, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, I think if we look back uh, two or three years, um, we, you would he hear people talking about gender diversity or diversity and inclusion, and there was a lot of timidity about talking about the real issues. And I think actually, perversely, the Me Too and the, Me, um, the Time's Up things have made women bolder in talking about you know what, this isn't okay, let's have a real conversation. Equally, and, I, and I, unfortunately uh, in the UK we do, don't have this problem as overtly, but if you follow anything that's going on in, in the US, there's a lot of police brutality against people of color, and equally that's opened up conversations where people are saying, wow, this isn't okay, I didn't realize this was happening. So this is very extreme, what I'm talking about. But I think the fact that you are emboldened to say, you're having a fearless female conversation, why do you have a picture of a, a, a woman of color on here, but you know, there aren't that many people here? And that's our responsibility, to start having those open and honest conversations. So I would just say I applaud you for raising it for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, speak, speak up and, and challenge. Challenge. Speak up and say what's on your because again, it's about getting people into the pipeline. So to the other panelists, anything, anything to, to add to that? Is your experience in your organisations? So in my organisation, we chose to, um, although the, the gender network is part of what we're doing, um, we've put it under a wider banner, which we've called All Sorts. So it takes all sorts to make a great business. Um, and under that banner, we're doing lots of different things. Um, one of the things that we started doing as a, a small organisation, we weren't really understanding what our diversity looked like. We weren't asking the question. Um, so we've started to um, put questions in our staff survey, so it's completely anonymous, but it helps us to understand if the feeling is different from any particular groups. So, um, you know, do people feel more engaged? Are we doing enough? You know, those kind of questions. So I think um, our women into leadership group is, is very multi-cultural, um, um, but it's a numbers game. There's very few women in leadership in the first place, and then to find the ethnicity as well, it's really difficult. You know, you, there just isn't that many people. So I think the more we can get through the pipeline, the more people we can encourage, whatever their background, to apply for the jobs by giving them the confidence um, and raising their self-esteem because a lot of it is around confidence. Can I do this? Am I worthy? All these kind of questions. If we can bring people's confidence up, we will see a more diverse workforce at all levels. And, and just to build on that point, um, we recently looked at our job ads and there's studies out there saying how um, language used can really enable women to self-filter themselves out of applying for that role, particularly if the language is very masculine. So words around um, adventurous or aggressive or outspoken, it can actually make women not want to apply for the job. Whereas words around compassion, connection, trusting can make women feel more, more um, engaged with the role. So we, we're looking at how we can make our language in ads more gender neutral. So to encourage the pipeline in a very balanced way, as opposed to making the ads feel very masculine or very feminine, it needs to be a lot more balanced. And I'd like to take that further and look at our website and how our copy is written. And are we, are we putting potentially women off in future? Because we've got to get more women through to get that diversity overall. So I think there's things we could all do, but it takes a bit of conscious thought to go down to that level of detail to say, we've got to start at this level to make a bigger difference going forward. Can I, I just want to very quickly, at American Express, we also have colleague networks that are focused on different um, identities of, of various kinds, and um, we try and have sponsors who, who don't necessarily, so we have a disability action network, we have a pride network, we have um, black and Asia, Asian uh, colleague employment network, um, we have OLA, which is for Hispanic um, uh, colleagues, we have WIN. Um, and they all work together as well, and this gives people an opportunity to sort of interact with different types of people because you don't necessarily have to identify with that to be part of that network. 
prayer. Thank you very much. Hello. And then to Rich Vane. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Is it Rohini? Did I? Rohini. Rohini. Thank you for your question. What I'd like to say is that I think Mary mentioned in her presentation that we are back to 2008 at the moment with gender equality. And I think it's very important that, that, that we're here and that we're opening up this conversation. And I work with, with a younger generation and we talk, about, um, we talk about sensitive questions, but mainly, mainly we talk about having the confidence to ask the questions that you have just asked us. And I think the more we do, the more people will, will come forward and the next conference we will have more speakers and representation of all levels and diversity. So thank you, you're paving the way and we are hoping to, to support you in that. Thank you. Okay, more questions. What's on your mind? Jamie, other side of the group. Hi, I'm Mary from Magix, Martin, and the first thing I want to say to you before I <laughs> thank you for raising that point. I'm also struck by that, that there, there isn't a gender ethnicity represented on the panel, so thanks for raising that. My question isn't about that, though. It's actually um, to Nikki, but also to the others in you know, how it affects you. Do you have any advice for networking within community, so in Brighton for example, there are lots of companies, some of them small companies, some of them slightly larger and growing. Do you have any advice or experience in networking between companies to help the careers of women? Do you know what, there's, there's absolutely loads of networks within Brighton and I moved down from London eight years ago and I was delighted at the almost like you get a, a virtual hug from other companies in Brighton. There's not the comp competition in London in the same way. Um, MD Hub is a brilliant network, but you have to be an MD to be in it. It's about 120 MDs across Brighton. It's a very, very balanced network of people that have, share similar problems. The She Says Network, run by Reefa Thorpe Tracy, uh, is excellent. Um, I did a keynote speech at that a, a year ago. And it's, it's a real... It's a brilliant support network, particularly of women in tech. So if, it's a, if that's an area of interest to you, Reefa is a brilliant person to get in touch with. And then there's a Chamber of Commerce, which I don't mean to be rude, I thought might be a bit old hat. Um, but it's not. It's brilliant. And the, the networking opportunities in the Chamber of Commerce are weekly. And it depends what you want to get involved in, whether it's digital, it's tech, it's art, it's creative. Whatever it is, there's always something going on. So there's many routes in to networking within Brighton. I, I have a chat with you about more of them later. But there are, there's so many platforms you can join. You've just got to choose the right one or else you'd be out every night. That's quite a good thing too. <laughs> Did you want to add, add to that comment? Hi, um, I'm Sally Brown. I work for an organisation called Happy Prime Business. Um, I'd be happy to speak to the lady and anyone else in the room. Um, we're a networking organisation and we have the Brighton area, up to Queen, um, quite a big geographic footprint. So we're very uh, inclusive, very diverse, um, and if anyone wants to speak to me, especially this lady, I'd be happy to chat with you That was great. Can you stand up so that everybody in the room is here on the floor? There's people who can all get a chance for coffee. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for your question. Do you have a question? Hi, my name is Farrah Gale from NatWest, and first thing I'll just say, say the organisation is a fantastic one, so if you don't know about it, find out all about it. It's a fantastic network. Um, so um, I, I took a role four years ago as a regional director with NatWest, um, responsibility for 10 corporate commercial offices, about 120 people. Uh, we have fantastic diversity, if you just look at the pure numbers, which is about 50-50. The challenge that I have is that my 10 directs, my senior leaders are all male, pale and stale. We kind of all affection refer to each other like that. So um, I had to create three new roles to bring in three ladies in. I've now got three leadership ladies around my table, all of them were part-time or compressed hours. But I've had to do that to kind of bring them through. So I think we're doing lots of great stuff around the diversity agenda. It's bright, it's kind of wider sense, and we have um, short list where you have to have at least one female, or also interview panel with at least one female, otherwise you end up just reverting to time, so you kind of keep it so you can take the box of having a diverse short list, but unless you can actually address on the interview panel, you know, it just gets the same result. Um, so we're not a good start, but our biggest challenge is how you create the churn at the more senior leadership levels, so people within the organisation 30, 40 years, 
um, and they've been in the bank a long time and they need to work on because people are living long for pension arrangements. So at last to ask the panel, you know, we've addressed the side of it, or started to address the side of it this morning around bringing the talent through, but how do we create the churn and the opportunity at the more senior level to bring that female talent through without, you know, you're being allowed to do it in terms of, you know, specific situations, monitoring and that kind of stuff. Have you any experience with that? Have you any thoughts and ideas? Maybe certainly the annex lady, you know, in her big organisation, maybe you might have some experience with how you've done that with your team. Okay, so it's a bit of a ramble, right? No, I, I, it's a great question, and um, I, I, there's no simple answer to it. You can't necessarily force people out. You know, you've been here a long time, and you're kind of a, you know, a dinosaur. Maybe it's time for you to be thinking about doing something else. You, you, you can't do that for people. And plus, they're probably still contributing in, in great ways. Um, so I think there's, there's an element of, uh, you know, you're sort of stuck with it in, to some degree, and there are probably lots of tactics that you can do. But one thing you could do is actually work with um, the more senior men in the organization to, to have them talk about the commitments that they're going to do to raise up the next level. So uh, I think the study that Mary was talking about with the CEOs, uh, the women's and their aspirations, I think I know what study you're talking about. Is it the Corn Ferry one? Yes. So, you know, I think in that study, 65% of the women who became CEOs, no, they never even considered it until somebody tapped them on the shoulder and told them, you know, you could actually be a CEO. So I think, you know, maybe challenging them a little bit to get out of their comfort zones and think about, um, you know, who have they sponsored? What commitments would they make? Um, another fact that I heard, I, I went to a women's conference for American Express last week with 170 of the most senior women at American Express, and they shared a lot with us. And one of them was that when um, uh, performance reviews are written, whether they're written by a man or a woman, um, the language used in the performance reviews for men are about things they did. They're about their actions and their impact. The reviews written for women, uh, about 70 percent of them contain uh, more descriptions of their personality traits. And it didn't matter whether it was men or women who were um, writing them. So I think the point that Mary made about you know, maybe having a senior man sponsor unconscious bias training and, and taking that on himself, because who knows, maybe it will open up to them something that they never, they have a passion for developing uh, unconscious bias and they want to go uh, leave the company and do that. So I think challenging them uh, might be a, a, a gentler way to address that. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, so I've had a bit of experience of this recently. Um, and I think the succession planning part is really important, but also taking the opportunities when they come up. So when there is somebody leaving, get straight in there, try and get that balance in the shortlist as soon as you, as soon as you possibly can. Um, the important thing is not to leave it to, uh, oh, I know someone that's good for that job. I've got some mates, some good, good men, that tends to be, um, some people that I can recommend. If you can get in there first and influence how that shortlist is being put together and target headhunters with that objective, I want a balanced shortlist. I want 50% women. And you tend to get it. Some roles are something more difficult, especially around IT, that kind of area. But generally, if you target headhunters to specifically look for a balanced shortlist, you will get good candidates. And that's the starting point. Great. Right. Thank you. And to add to that, encouraging the women who already exist in your organization to put their hands forward, give them the, give them the belief, help them with the, the self-belief and the encouragement um, and any support that they might need to go for it themselves if there are any potential candidates in the family. Great, thank you. Question at the front here, please, Jamie. My name is Lisa Clegg, I'm from Gavin Airport. We've talked a bit about some of the um, attraction methodology we use about gender neutral language, etc. And then we heard earlier about some of the selection methodology that could be used to attract females or to ensure that they perform better or are given equal opportunity. Could you talk to us about any other selection or attraction methodology that you're utilising that you found particularly successful in terms of attracting um, and selecting? best one from my point of view is taking the names off the CVs. 
it's really simple. I mean, it takes a bit of admin time, but it's easy to do. And then shortlisting managers are looking at it completely unbiased. Um, and I think going back a step in terms of attracting women to apply is be out there talking about your organisation, particularly as a woman, and, and setting that role model behaviour right at the beginning of the whole process. Because the number of people who have come to Propel Net have said, I saw you talk at this event, I saw this happening, or I saw somebody else talk, and we've got Sophie here who's in the audience, and she spoke at an event called Brighton SEO in front of 1,500 people. It's, it's put your women on stage and, it, and ask them to step up and be on that stage. Obviously, don't force them someone if they're not comfortable, but be out there and find your stage and encourage other women that they will have that opportunity too. Yeah, we have, um, after the break, we've got Janine who's going to be talking about um, specifically around recruitment strategies, so um, you might get some more insights uh, on that particular uh, topic then. Great, thank you. There was another hand. There's two more hands here. Let's go over here first and then we'll come to you. Hello. Is it working? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'm Sula. I work with Nikki at the It's my question. It's probably spurred from your niece, which is I, I can start with this one and um, again, you know, I think it's about role models. Um, again, many of the women who have uh, accomplished a lot um, from you know, the, what I was referring to before um, came from situations where actually they had uh, really difficult personal circumstances, maybe lost a parent and then saw a mother, um, you know, and this we're talking, you know, 30 years ago, having to go out and make their way in the world. We live in a different world now where there are so many women role models. Um, and yet at the same time, um, there are these mental barriers. So I think, again, having open and honest conversations and pointing out um, role models to girls. I'm sure you, other people Andrew, probably have. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. We work very closely with universities and what I see working really well is companies working closely with universities as well or alumni going back and giving talks so that it's tangible and it's 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 a, it's a role model story that's out there because some of some of the um, stories that these girls hear is exactly what you said becoming teachers or they don't have they don't have the opportunity to hear about fantastic women out there and and I think Mary said it in her talk you know if I can do it you can do it we need more of these stories and we encourage companies to give up their time and do mentorship and coaching and visiting uh, schools and universities and talk to the, the future talent. There's a, there's a recent study that says um, if, if you ask uh, young girls uh, at between the age of 9 and 13 whether they believe that they can have the same career as boys, 90% of them will say yes. And when you ask the same question in the age group of 17 to 21, 30% will say yes. So the earlier we start, the earlier we start this job, the bigger success we're going to have. So do you think it has to be something that the government backs and we can get into actual schools as part of curriculum? For sort of 30 to 16 rather than waiting to the university age? Could you repeat the question? I didn't hear the beginning. It was, I'm just thinking it has to be something that the government is behind, so we're doing as part of curriculum. People if we're not doing it from the age of 13 to 16 and they're already going to university and thinking at that point then they're not going to become CEOs, how do we get into actual schools, not maybe universities, to make those changes? In an, in an ideal scenario, um, yes, I think it should be and we, we should start this work as early as possible. We can talk about confidence and just the world of work what I see out there, young people, young women who start work, it's, it's such a new world for them. So the, the confidence that they have at the, at the end of their studies, just by getting into the world of work, 
is going down so fast because it's such a new new environment. So yes, my answer is ideally it should be backed up, backed up and the earlier we start the better. Just building on that, um, has anyone in the room heard of Maker Club? Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's a, a really easy way for all of us to be able to support younger kids from the age of five, I think it is, to 13 to get involved in a uh, new acronym for me, STEAM, not STEM, STEAM, the A is Arts. Uh-huh, Makes it easy great. to get funding from the Arts Council, apparently. <laughs> um, but if you get involved as a company, it really takes a lot of time and effort to bring on a, a child, and actually you're probably not an expert at it. Whereas Maker Club are brilliant at bringing on children in the STEAM environment to give them the skills, and particularly girls, to have the confidence to be developing in tech and engineering and maths and art and, and science. And I think if you work with an expert to do it, it's not just absolving your responsibility, but it's enabling other people to take on that responsibility because you can help fund it, and then it doesn't fall to the government, which potentially means it won't happen in many instances. So everyone in the room could get involved in something like Maker Club and supporting a child to, to develop through that programme and have the confidence to think I can have the same job and same opportunities going forward. Another plug for um, Be The Change, which is a programme that we as an organisation have been involved with. Um, It's targeting year nines, so they're at that very difficult age. Um, What age would that be? uh, About 12, 13-ish, yeah, Yeah, that sort of age. Um, uh, It's not specifically for girls, but there is a very mixed um, group from local schools and I think Be The Change run in several different areas. Um, we've been involved in the Gatwick area one and it's a really positive way of getting your employees involved as well because they become business coaches, they team up with the the young people and they bring so much back to the organisation, absolutely love it as an experience. Can I just add to that as well? Um, My name is Saffron, I'm from the University of Sussex, but sometimes it doesn't. Particularly from the Sussex Innovation Centre, which I think he knows very well. Um, we're here today representing the university, representing um, internships and opportunities for work placements with, with local businesses. But I also have an enterprise advisor with Coast Capital, and that works with schools, colleges, and looking for business people all the time to go in and speak at college level and at school level, in particular, to really need to influence them. Sussex Innovation Centre has been brilliant for our business. Your, your team are amazing, thank you. Thank you. And a, and a personal experience I had recently, um, I, I had the opportunity to speak at Southampton Southern University on International Women's Day. Um, and it was the first time that I'd spoken to university um, undergrads, I think it was the technical term, right? Undergrads. Um, and I have to say how hugely rewarding for me personally that was, how much I got, got out of um, just taking that hour and a half to be with them. Um, you know, to hear some of their concerns and their fears, and how on earth do we step into this world of work, you know, particularly as women, etc. Um, so it was a real eye opener for me, but it was also, um, it, was a re- it, it, it was really rewarding uh, and self fulfilling. So, you know, if, you, if you're not involved um, in any way, then, you know, certainly speaking from my experience, um, it's something that's very worth doing. Okay, and there was a question here. You've been waiting so patiently, thank you. What question do you have for us? Hi, I'm Marina Molomni, and I'm from American Express, as well as I'm part of the team in terms of the American Express Network. We talk a lot about uh, confidence, which is great, and we know it's one of our opportunities. But I would be interested to know uh, from your experience on the theme of ambition. Because I think there is still a bit of stigma. If a woman is ambitious, it can be a bit shy to, to say that. And setting a man is actually a good trait. So what can we do to, to change the mindset there? Go ahead. Oh, please, no, please, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for, for that brilliant question. In my experience, from the training room and working um, with young young women, one of the one of the major um, um, challenges we face is is not that they they're not ambitious. It's exactly what you just described. They they don't know how to talk about their ambitions, and part of this is is confidence, and another part of of um, uh, bringing out your Ambition is how 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 you're going to present that to your to your bosses, your to 
to where you work, how can you talk about your ambition and not be judged and be told that you, you are the bossy or you're too pushy, which is an existing, it's an existing stigma and I think it's really important to, to talk about these issues. Um, so from, from my point of view, one way to do that is, is through training and, and working on confidence and using techniques to put yourself forward without coming across as pushy. I have a great example um, that was shared with me recently about a woman who, uh, she was a, the country manager of our operations in France, and when she got promoted, she said within 24 hours, every single um, male manager had sent her an email asking for uh, 15 or 20 minutes of her time, and then when she met with them, you know, it was all about how great they were and how they were the next one in line. And she said, not once, and, and she has a very good gender uh, balance of men and women in her organization. Not one woman came to her to say, "Oh, now that you're the country manager, let me meet with you and basically tell you about myself." And she, so I think for me that was a great example of how women don't um, take take the risks sometimes to put themselves forward. They, you don't have to say, hey, I'm ambitious and I want to be at the top. You could say, hey, I would like to meet you and talk to you about what I'm good at, and it may feel more comfortable for a woman. I think women tend to be more motivated by personal challenge and by um, uh, a sense of purpose than by pure competition or you know moving up the ladder so it might be reframing um, and, and coaching women like you said on how to do that in a way that's comfortable for them can I just be, build on what um, Jill said um, when you when you said men put themselves forward and they said well let me tell you about my successes and what, what I've done this is what we see in the training room is that women know they could do that but when you say to them what are you going to say about your successes they say well I just do my job what do you mean successes and it it takes a, a, a lot of time and training and mentoring to for them to be able to say well this is what I've done and have that five minute conversation exactly. with the new leader and say I just wanted to grab you for five minutes because this is what I've done in the in the past. Here are my projects, and I wanted you to know about that. Yeah, indeed. And it's certainly one of uh, one of the themes of topics that's recurring in the coaching sessions that I have with uh, senior leaders, and sometimes with uh, with male leaders as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly a, a strong thing with, with female leaders. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So I know you've been waiting patiently over there at the back. What's on your mind? I uh, wanted to bring Joe for an entrepreneurial uh, group company, so it's um, uh, One of the things that strikes me and has, has, has um, hit me for many years now, thought about this for many years, is we, we and, and I totally agree about women and confidence and we need to be mentor and help and uh, all of that stuff. I totally agree with all of that. But I personally don't believe things are actually going to change until attitudes change and people recognise women's strengths without women having to change. The, the focus is always on what women have to do to change to be successful. Women are already good enough to be successful. It's not just about women having to do all the work to overcome the barriers that are there for them. It's about men understanding the talent of women and removing the barriers for them. And that's my observation. Just to, sorry, just to build on that, there's um, you probably seen a brilliant TED talk by Margaret Hefferden mm -hmm. about um, forget the pecking order at work. And she says exactly the same thing. You don't have to be one of the boys to make this work. And they did ex um, experiments around most successful teams. And most successful teams are the ones that show high degrees of social sensitivity, give equal time for each other so no one's dominating in the room. And the most successful teams tend to be the ones that have women in them. And it's, it's so the women don't have to change, the women just need to be there. It's a fantastic TED talk. It's 18 minutes long as they all are. I recommend watching it. Uh, and I, I always uh, often use the phrase, um, I'm unashamedly feminine. Um, and, and I'm very proud of that fact. And 
you know, it's not about it's not necessarily about us changing, it's the environment. And, and Antoinette is going to speak to us uh, this afternoon, um, specifically around culture um, and changing that culture. So um, we'll build on that later on today. Okay, well, yeah. thank you very much indeed <laughs> to our panel. Um, sadly, that's all the questions we do have time for. I know there were another couple of hands coming up. So um, you're going to be joining us um, in the break coming up right now, and also lunchtime, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I know that they are willing to continue conversations and further questions that you have. But thank you very much indeed, ladies.